this morning's session. Um, I'm Conrad Pilditch um, and I look after Dynamic Seas and I'm co-chairing this session with Carolyn Lundquist who's looking after Managed Seas and she'll take over the chair um, for the second half of the session after morning tea. Um, I just want to remind uh, people in the audience we'll take your questions via pigeonhole again please so please feed them through and if you've got a specific question for a presenter please put the name of the presenter that you'd like to address that to. So it's my job today to spend a couple of minutes just introducing um, the session, which will run over two uh, sessions this morning, about understanding degradation and recovery um, in marine eco social ecological systems. And the first part of the challenge in phase one of the challenge, a lot of this has been looking at the degradation or the impact of our activities on the marine environment. Now, as we know, a lot of the goods and services we take out of the marine environment are underpinned by a hidden infrastructure. And that hidden infrastructure is the interactions between the plants, the animals and the microbes and their physical environment that provides the ecological function that underpins the goods and services. So for example in a lot of our estuaries with dense aggregations of shellfish, they filter the water and help reduce the turbidity, keeping that water column clear. That clear water column may for example support submerged aquatic vegetation that is habitat for juvenile fish that then underpins coastal fisheries out on the shelf. But as our activities in coastal systems begin to increase and our stress that we put on these systems, that hidden infrastructure has to cope with those changes. And as we know, in marine ecosystems, the stresses are many and they're increasing. And those stresses due to our activities may be based on land, diffuse and occur over large temporal and spatial scales, such as the runoff of nutrients and sediments, or they may be associated with point activities such as when shipwrecks go down, for example, or wastewater treatments. So it's a challenging environment and we need a lot of good biophysical science to understand the impacts of those stresses on these systems. If we're going to manage these systems, we need to know how these systems respond to stress. We need to know how these different habitats are connected across time and space so we can link our activities in one place to impacts in other spaces. So in this session we're going to be hearing some really interesting and exciting results from uh, work that's been funded by the challenge on ecosystem connectivity. One of the big factors is trying to understand how places are connected in time and space through the movement of water. So Craig Stevens will be talking a little bit about his work understanding how hydrodynamics within the case study in the focal area are connecting places in time and space how stresses such as nutrients and sediments coming in off land are dispersed and underpin impacts on these different activities. Now clearly that's one form of con connectivity, but within the biological food webs there's another method in which our activities can impact upon these ecosystems. So we'll hear a talk in the second part of the session from Daniel Duck from a mountains to sea approach looking at how the carbon that's generated, terrestrial carbon on land, is connected to deep sea communities through the Kaikoura Canyon. Steve Wing will be talking shortly about his work on terms of how food webs are modifying and accumulating toxins and tracing contaminants through these food webs. His research group have been doing some fantastic work looking at movement of contaminants and biochemical fluxes through food webs associated with aquaculture and also the impacts of changing um, primary production in terms of the loss of kelp forests, how that's impacting the food webs in the coastal ecosystems. Also about the movement of animals and how those animals are, are connecting different places and times. We're also got to hear a series of talks on the nature of change. So as our stresses increase and as we begin to erode that hidden infrastructure, the system has resilience and maybe our indicators of change are showing no response. Often that means an increase in the activity. However, the nature of change in our systems isn't linear. We're not turning up dials and turning down dials. That nature of change can be radical and systems can switch or reach a tipping point into a non-desirable state. I'm not talking about the responses from cataclysmic events such as uplift. I'm talking about those surprises as we're going along and the system changes into another state. Candida will be reporting on results from the tipping points experiments from soft sediment ecosystems where we've been looking at the combined effects of sedimentation and nutrient input on the functioning of estuarine systems. 
Nick Shears in the session after morning tea will also be talking a little bit of work from the rocky reef systems where on open coastal systems they've been looking at the impacts on turbidity and light climate and how that's affecting the macroalgal production and these, uh, and these ecosystems. We're also within the challenge developing tools to better help ma manage these systems. Obviously that hidden infrastructure is dependent on the biodiversity and the types of animals and plants that are in these systems. There's, we'll hear from research today about tools that are being developed for rapid assessments of uh, the marine biodiversity, not on traditional taxonomic tools where people are going out and having a look at counting what's there, but using environmental DNA to provide new rapid assessments. Part of the challenge within, within the science is getting the science into the community and into the hands of the people that can use it. Regan Fairley will be talking about a new initiative of getting Western science and Mataranga knowledge into a format for kaitiaki to better manage their ecosystems as well. And we'll hear from him towards the end of the session today. There's also about how we link our understanding of ecological functioning into the higher level and into the services. And that's an important gap. We may know a lot about how these systems respond to stress, but getting it into a scale that's useful for managers is also very important. So part of the uh, one of the talks that Drew will give a little bit later is on linking habitats to ecosystem services. So how can we scale up our understanding of functioning and how these functions respond to stresses into a scale that is useful for managers and service delivery. We'll also have, uh, we'll hear from Kate Davies about the pathways to management and how these cumulative effects and multiple stresses can be navigated through a complex system of different management agencies. And Kate will talk about her research in terms of bringing together different agencies and different sets of people in order to better manage and provide a pathway through to better management.